over there. Right? Thank you. He's in a spotlight. Huh? It's a natural spotlight. This is what happens. Well, I think I have to exercise some authority. Yeah, you're just going to have to. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to our last panel uh, of what has been, I'm sure you, you agree, very interesting uh, conference. Uh, I'm Eduardo Posada Carbo, and I, I'm at the Latin American Center, and I will be chairing this session. We have uh, three speakers today, Daniel Ortega, uh, based uh, at the CAF, Carlota Perez at the London School of Economics, and Fabiana Machado at the IDB. You all have their CVs uh, in, in your uh, uh, papers, so I'm, I'm not going to go into further details. We are uh, uh, behind our schedule, and we ought to finish by 5.30. So I w without further ado, uh, welcome uh, Daniel Ortega will start his presentation. Uh, we, they all have agreed to limit the presentation to 20 minutes, about 20 minutes, uh, and, and uh, we'll keep it like that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> You're going to give us a reminder, yeah? Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for enduring uh, up until this time of the day and during past lunch and coffee. I appreciate it. Uh, we all appreciate it. Um, it's always an honor to speak uh, at this university and uh, this uh, prestigious college, so I thank um, everyone for the opportunity. Um, so let me just uh, remind ourselves why we are uh, here today. Uh, we are here today because we've essentially, as has been um, mentioned already uh, in different ways throughout the day, that we've really made no progress whatsoever on reducing informality over the past um, 20 years. Um, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how you measure it. We've had a big discussion about measuring it uh, using Social Security coverage or, or measuring it uh, using a, um, a labor firm size, a, a firm size measure, uh, which uh, Jose Antonio called uh, the, the economic measure. But that doesn't really matter how you measure it. We've made no progress. Uh, and so what I want to talk to you about today is go back to the economics uh, principles t um, that, in our view, give uh, rise to this phenomenon and maybe start to think about ways uh, in which uh, we can actually change this. Uh, so earlier, where's David? Where's David? David is no, no longer here. Uh, he, he said that uh, us economists uh, should not forget about the politics. Uh, and I won't talk about politics at all during this presentation. But uh, that doesn't mean that we don't think uh, politics are important, but we do think that we need to get our economic principles right and then uh, uh, to incorporate the complexities of, um, of politics, of policies uh, in particular. So uh, I want to start to, by bringing to your attention uh, one very specific fact, which is that Latin Americans, uh, when compared to people who work in a country like the US work in very, very small firms. So this graph here shows the fraction of people uh, who work in firms that have one to nine employees, uh, uh, 10 to 49 uh, workers, and 100 or more. So you see, this is for the US. Uh, more than half of people who work in the U.S. work in firms that are large, essentially. And when you contrast this to a number of Latin American countries, uh, you can see that the difference is stark. Just as an example, take a look at Bolivia. It shows that 82% of workers in Bolivia, 82%, just think about that number, 
work in a firm that is less than 10 employees large. And this is, of course, Bolivia is the most ex extreme example here, but it's true, it's a pattern that is true for every country in Latin America. We essentially work in very small firms. Now, this, uh, wh why are these two facts, um, two sides of the same coin? The fact that we have high informality is basically one side of the coin of the fact that we have very small firms. These are basically the two same things, and why is this the case? And if we look at the number of people who call themselves their own boss, uh, so that they are em employed by themselves, they don't have a, a boss, you could, we would, and we compare the US with Latin America, we would say, wow, Latin America has a lot of entrepreneurship. So we are, you know, we should be thriving. We should be thriving with innovation. Uh, but it turns out that uh, most of these are really just self-employed workers. These are people who, in a different world, for example, if they were in the US, most of these people would actually um, be working in, uh, as salaried workers in larger firms. Now, if you look at this, the flip side of the graph that I showed before is that these employers here, we, about, we have, if we look at the people who employ other people, who not only are their own bosses, but who employ other people, in the U.S., as compared to Latin America, it's pretty much the same fraction of the, wor of the workforce. But the big difference is that the people, people in the U.S. hire more people than employee, employers in Latin America. So, of course, this is just the flip side of, the, of what I was saying before, because our firms are smaller. And we have a lot of people who are self-employed. So, above and beyond, you know, if, you know, the... the how many of pe people we classify as, as informal workers because they, they work in, in relatively small firms and whether you, you use the threshold of four workers or five workers or six workers as a small firm and therefore uh, necessarily uh, classifiable as an informal firm. Uh, what really matters is that you know, overall, if you look at the continuum of possibilities of the size of firms, uh, essentially Latin America is bunched up at the very small firm segment, okay? And so our self-employed workers, so the, the, these self-employed workers are essentially our informal sector uh, workers. And uh, the distrib so a distribution, uh, a size distribution with a few large firms is essentially equivalent to having a large informal sector, okay? Simply because those people are not employed in a large firm. So those two things, we need to view them as uh, one and the same uh, is our proposition. Uh, and if we do this, we'll, we, we, we'll, we'll make some headway into thinking about ways, the best ways of really reducing informality um, um, in the long term. Okay, so of course informality is costly. This has been said over and over again throughout the day in different ways. Informality is actually, I wouldn't really say, someone asked the question earlier today, I think it was, it was Diego who was saying, well, should we look at productivity, low productivity affecting informality or informality affecting low productivity? I think they're just the same thing. You know, and that, that's part of the, the thing. You, it really doesn't, uh, basically low productivity is high informality. It's also uh, equivalent to low GDP per capita. It's also low wages and ultimately low welfare. So our societies, the biggest challenge that we have in cutting informality in our societies is creating prosperous societies. You know, we need to create jobs, we need to create uh, firms, um, above and beyond, you know, uh, all these um, um, partial intermediate uh, policies that we can think of that are also important, but that do not go to the root of the problem, which is the fact that we have a structure in our economy with a very large number of small firms and very small number of large firms, okay? So informality is not only co is costly because it's, it's equivalent to low welfare as a, in social terms, 
But it's also important because it can become a trap. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this. But low, but, but it, it's a trap because um, it leads to low accumulation of skills on the job. So people who work in the informal sector essentially get trained less than people who work in the formal sector. And also they learn less about what they do. So they lear the learning by doing process that leads to skill accumulation over time in, a work, in your work environment is less important, less significant when you're in the informal sector as compared to the formal sector. And also you learn less from your peers because your peers are pretty much like you. They don't, they're untrained and they're doing simple tasks. And when you're working in an organization that is small, you really can't deal with a big enterprise. So you really have very different, very limited scope of learning from different people. So learning from your peers is also less frequent when you're in the informal sector. So basically, skill accumulation is hurt significantly by, um, by high informality. Now, of course, uh, th this graph here, these, both of these graphs basically show that training on the job is related to firm size. That's one of the things I was just saying. And also uh, self-reporting, learning by doing and learning from your peers is also related to firm size. So as I said, it's not only that we look at the formal and formal sector in whatever definition. If we look at firm size as our relevant measure, we can look at a continuum of uh, sizes of firms, we can see that these phenomena that we're talking about it actually occur throughout this continuum. Okay, uh, so it's also uh, leads to low informality also leads to low incentives for workers to acquire uh, education and for firms to in innovate and accumulate human capital. Now this is why it becomes a trap because on the one hand well people if their labor market prospects are basically finding an informal sector job where having a college degree really is not worth that much then you might as well just drop out or you drop out of high school actually uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a second and obviously the least the last but not least uh, is that uh, higher informality leads to lower tax collection, which implies fewer public goods, which are important for any productive society. Okay? Uh, above and beyond, we have had, we, we could, I don't want to go into this discussion, but we've uh, touched upon it throughout the day a little bit, but having higher taxes also has uh, the implication of empowering the population in a political sense to actually hold uh, politicians accountable for what they do. So this is also another channel through which this is important for development. Uh, we've actually published a book on this be, uh, before. Uh, okay, sorry. Now, this cost is not distributed equally across the population. It's, of course, the poorest and the least educated are the most uh, affected by, by informality. Of course, people who drop out of school have a much higher probability of being in the informal sector. And it turns out that if you, if you fall in the informal sector, if your first job is in the informal sector, it's going to be very difficult for you through, to get out of the informal sector throughout your life. So your probability of remaining in the informal sector actually doesn't decrease very much when, as you get older, if you're in the informal sector. Okay? Um, with this goes to, to the idea that the transition, and there was an interesting uh, um, presentation earlier today on this, transiting to the transition from uh, in the informal sector to the formal sector is actually uh, a very uh, difficult thing to do. Uh, so one key message that I want you to take away today, uh, and that is I think if you want to take just one idea from my presentation, I want, you to, I want it to be this idea, that the level of informality is an equilibrium in the economy. Okay, the level of informality that we see today is a self-reinforcing equilibrium, basically what we call a stable equilibrium. It's an equilibrium because people, well, we have this high level of, of informality and there are no forces pushing that equilibrium to change. So if we want to change that equilibrium, we need to do very significant things. And why, what are the two pieces of this equilibrium? 
One is the slow growth of formal firms. And there are many constraints to growth of formal firms, and I'll talk to, about them in a, in a minute. Uh, someone mentioned today, I think it was you, right? You, you mentioned that one of the largest, the enterprise, World Bank's Enterprise Survey has systematically shown, suggested, that uh, the quality of the labor force is viewed by surveyed enterprises as one of the major constraints to growth, okay, uh, in, in, in Latin America. So large firms don't grow, and because large firms don't grow, there are, there's really no demand for labor in the formal sector. Uh, so there are many informal workers with little uh, capabilities to transition into the, informal into the formal sector. So it's, a, it's an equilibrium. You basically have a lot of people who say, no, well, I'll just stay in the informal sector, and my capabilities will actually depreciate over time, um, and I, I don't have any incentive to accumulate the, cap the capabilities necessary to have a formal sector job because I, the probability of actually doing that is very low, so I might as well just stay where I am. So it's an, it's an equilibrium. It's a bad equilibrium, obviously something that we don't want, but it's the reason why we are... Um, uh, where we are, and we have not made any progress over the past uh, several, you know, 20 more years. In addition to this, um, there's very little evidence that small enterprises can, are like the solution to, uh, to, to uh, our productivity problems. So the productivity growth of small firms and micro enterprises is very weak, uh, and it's very, 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 it's not impossible. So you need to have some public sector support to potentially high growth and highly innovative firms to, to emerge and all of that's very important. But we cannot uh, rest our hopes on the fact that micro enterprises uh, made up, uh, composed basically of unskilled workers are going to change, are going to lead to a, a major productive transformation in the economy. Okay. So this is, here is just an, an illustration of the stark difference in firm growth in the U.S. versus Mexico and India. Um, and it shows that the average um, firm size uh, of a firm over, over you know, as, as the firm ages, its size relative to the size it had when it was age five. Okay, So here they're age five. And here, this firm in the U.S. is age 40. So let's say when a firm is 35 years old, it's about six times the size it was when it was five in the U.S. But in Mexico, it's just double the size. So this is just an illustration. Uh, this comes from a, 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 a widely cited paper uh, that's, that shows that, in fact, one of the major uh, problems that... Uh, countries like Mexico and India, and this extends, IDB has done some work in this, uh, extending this kind of analysis to other countries in Latin America, it basically shows the same thing. We have very slow, formal firm growth. Now, why don't firm, firms uh, grow? They don't grow uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, there's um, uh, one, one important thing is that firms that are improductive, like bad firms, they survive for too long. So really, firms that should just die off very quickly in society, they just linger on and on and on, and, they, and what that does is that ties up resources that should be assigned to something more productive, uh, to a different activity, different... So, so that's one problem that we have. We have negative selection in the composition of uh, firm survival uh, in our uh, economies. There's evidence that there's poor management practices and innovation in the private sector in Latin America. This is a, um, uh, something that's been widely cited as well. There's scarcity of critical inputs, quality of labor being uh, especially important. Uh, and of course, there are economic and institutional constraints to growth. Financing constraints uh, are relevant. Uh, lack of infrastructure, quality infrastructure has been shown to be an important complement to private sector growth. Um, and of course, uh, the regulatory environment uh, and taxes can actually have an effect here. And I think the jury is still out about the specific weight about, uh, on, on the taxation part, but it's certainly uh, relevant. Now, why are informal workers stuck in the informal sector? Well, uh, once in the informal sector, 
there's skill depreciation. If you're a worker in the, in the informal sector, your skills will begin to depreciate. And proof of that is, I don't know if you showed this, but uh, other studies that we've actually done and we published um, in, our, in our report in, in 2013 is showing that the probability of transiting from the informal sector to the formal sector decreases with time. So if you spend one year, if you've been in the informal sector for one year, you have a higher probability of moving to the formal sector than if you've had 10 years. So what that means is that over time, if you're in the informal sector, your skill set depreciates, okay? Uh, and of course, as I showed before, there's very little training, uh, so <clears throat> the probability of transit also changes. At the aggregate level, people also have little incentives to accumulate skills before entering the labor market. Uh, and uh, just a statistic that shows uh, how bad this problem is, uh, we have uh, only 50% of, of our young people finish high school. Uh, and this is, of course, related to the probability of actually getting a formal sector job. So, and we've shown that a person's first job it turns out to be key for their future employment path. Uh, it turns out that uh, in Peru, uh, studies showed that for adults between 20, for between 15 and 29, a person is 25% more likely to have a formal labor contract in the current job if their first employment, whenever that was, was formal, okay? Now, let me show you just uh, one. I want to illustrate how dramatically a person's prospects in life can change if they start off with the right foot. And this is something that we've evaluated, a very important program in Argentina. We did a randomized impact evaluation uh, of a program that subsidizes internships in the formal sector for kids who are just coming out of school and they are disadvantaged. And what we show is that kids are, after 12 months after the program ended, kids are 40% more likely uh, of having um, a formal sector job. So this here is the trajectory from that uh, evaluation. And you can see this is the internship period. And even after 12 months, after, after it was over, you could see the, that the probability of the internship beneficiaries having a formal sector job is 40% higher than those who didn't participate. So you can make a huge difference by simply helping kids not fall in the informal sector as their first job experience. Because as soon as they get in there, they get gradually absorbed and stuck there, essentially. And they have incentives to drop out of school, et cetera, et cetera. So what to do? And this is, uh, I think, my second to last uh, slide. On the labor demand side, this has to, well, we, we need to help formal firms uh, grow, OK? Uh, so we want to lift some of the constraints that the formal sector faces for growing. Uh, one thing uh, here is think about bankruptcy regulation. We need to lower the cost for firms to, uh, to shut down, basically. Um, that's something that, that, that would actually help the mix, the quality mix of the firms that we have in our economies. Uh, we might think about improving management education. Uh, support finance to large firms, not only micro, I mean, microfinance is like the panacea of microfinance is going to help solve all of our poverty problems. No. We need to finance the growth of formal firms. We need, because even large firms, even firms with 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 employees in Latin America do face financing constraints. They do face a, a premium in the, t in the interest rates that they pay that makes them, that it's a hindrance to their growth. So we need to think about helping those firms also grow. Uh, of course, infrastructure investment and provide the proper regulatory environment. I don't want to say too much about that uh, because our book uh, this year, CAF's uh, flagship report, is on skill uh, acquisition uh, throughout the life cycle. So uh, we want to think about also the supply side, the labor supply side. So in terms of labor supply side, we want to maybe support uh, school to work transitions, think about support programs that uh, entail labor uh, training both on the job and, and training before, uh, for, for, uh, for work before uh, people get out of school. Um, 
Uh, well, someone mentioned uh, an unemployment insurance uh, as a as a po potentially important uh, mechanism. That's uh, that's very important too. In North America, that doesn't really exist, but it has to be well designed because it's very easy for an unemployment insurance to create uh, perverse incentives in an economy, uh, and of course, the issues of uh, information and labor intermediation, so that we can help people find in the labor market, help them find the right match in the formal sector uh, in terms of job, in terms of uh, the right job. So I just want to end with this picture that uh, essentially I started off with. Um, and I just want to highlight that the main challenge that we face in reducing informality is that we need larger formal firms. And for that, we need, uh, we need both work on helping larger firms grow, and we need help on moving some of these people from the self-employed sector to, uh, to the formal uh, sector as employed salaried workers. So this is the main idea of our presentation. And this doesn't uh, take away from other details that have been discussed today, but I think that we really need to focus on the core economic principles that, are, that define informality and low productivity in our economies in order to make progress in this, in this sense. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And we'll take questions after the three presentations. But let me now welcome uh, Carlota Perez, Professor of Technology and Development from the London School of Economics. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here, although I'm not an expert in the informal sector. I'm a technical change person. I work on technological revolutions and their impact. So what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is how technical change, major technical change like the ICT revolution, changes policy options in the new conditions. Uh, there is something that's very important to understand, and it's that there are no good policies in themselves. Policies are only good if they're adequate. And if the context changes, adequacy changes too. So you've got to always look at what is changing in order to know whether the policies that used to work continue to work, the policies that didn't work, will they now work, or should we think of new policies to confront uh, what we have you know, the things that have been changing. So, um, if we think of what's happening today, that technical change is really transforming the context for development. Globalization happened because of ICT. When we had um, mass production, we didn't have globalization. We had international trade, we had international relations, and we had the first world, the second world, and the third world. And that was because mass production was really a system which was based upon producing great quantities of identical products which became low cost thanks to mass production, and then we needed low, I mean we, they, the advanced world needed low cost energy and low cost materials. And therefore the third world was not producing these big quantities of things. And when we used uh, import substitution, we ended up just assembling and therefore not learning very much. Which by the way is one of the causes why our companies are small. Because we didn't start with something where we had everything, the design, the product, and everything, and then you open your market, and then you grow even further, and then you innovate some more. No, we just got mature technologies, and we just got the size that we were supposed to do, very often with very low capacity utilization. And some of those companies have survived, others haven't, but we don't, because of import substitution, which, by the way, was wonderful. I defended 100% for the moment when it was right. Now, it's no longer right, but we are now living with the consequences of the way we set up production then. So just as we had the division between the advanced world and the third world, we had the division between the 
assembly firms, the big firms, or not only assembly because the really big ones are the ones that do beer and food and things like that, which were not just assembly firms. Those were the big ones. And then because there was nothing else, we had all this informal sector that sort of filled the little holes. So we have, that was the history. And that is what we have inherited, and that's very much what, what we sometimes discuss. So what I'd like to do, and I must confess that I haven't gone deeply into this. I'm not working on this now. I'm working on the five technological revolutions on the advanced world and, and the role of the state and so on. So I will go, I will just throw the ideas at you and see what happens. This is my, my first attempt at looking at this thing. So what I say is that some of the old problems remain, of course. You know, you inherit whatever happened and then you have to face that. But the old solutions should be re-examined. Maybe the old problems are still there, but maybe we have new solutions for them. So what I'd like to share with you is my thoughts on this for facing or reducing the informal economy. So I begin by wondering what the sources of the informal economy are. Apart from this thing that I just told you, that's the history of how we did import substitution, uh, which there wasn't very much of an option and we were very successful at doing it. We got a lot of, we got a middle class and we got a lot of employment and a lot of growth, fantastic growth, really fantastic growth during that time, but growth is not enough because we didn't learn much. So I think that the informal economy began by the lack of opportunities in the countryside because during mass production, we didn't really worry about the rural environment and therefore thousands and thousands of people came with the mirage of the job opportunities in the cities which of course, <laughs> there's informal economy because it was a mirage, there wasn't that much for everybody. And the lack of opportunities in the slums, of course, when people come to the cities and, and create these horrendous conditions of living, it's very difficult for that to become a market for people to do things for that. So people get out of the slum and do a little thing over there and then come back to their conditions. So somehow this, this whole brew that's made up of migrants and their sons and, and grandchildren and so on that live in this growing area of all our cities, that is a tremendous problem that we inherited from the lack of opportunities in the countryside and from the lack of enough opportunities in the cities. So what have been the attempted solutions? Well, first, try to create enough jobs to absorb them. That wasn't possible and it still isn't. Try to attract them into the formal economy that has had some successes. Try to formalize informality with some social security arrangement or something that also has had some successes. But I wonder whether those are the only ones and whether because the world has been changing, maybe there are other possibilities. Technology and globalization have transformed markets. They've created different opportunities both for their entrepreneurial spirit and for public action to solve the problem. I think it's very important for us to realize that in the slums you have three options. You either become an informal economy person or you become a criminal, join one of the bands, or you do nothing but just pine and go into this horrible situation of nothingness. So in fact, the informal economy people are the best. They are, you know, the, both the, the criminals and the informal economy want to have a better life. But if you choose to work for that better life, you are a more promising person in society than the people who decide they're just going to steal it or get it somehow. But they both are moving. So we need to create conditions so that people will want to... Those, those migrants who are actually all migrants are very brave and very wonderful. Everybody should welcome migrants because to do what they do in order to improve their lives or their children is, is quite amazing. It's so much easier to be born in, a, in an advanced world country where everything is there, even if you could have trouble. But anyway, I'm saying that things have changed. What exactly has changed? Well, first of all, markets are hyper-segmented, including multiple niches at premium prices. 
So we g come from a world where mass production guaranteed low prices for all sorts of things. The other things, the ones that were handmade and the little things and so on, they actually had low prices too. It's really, you know, there was no recognition of the effort, even, even a, a wedding dress or a wedding cake or something, which is a very complicated thing, was not really the way now. Organic food, people paid three times as much. And for all sorts of, you know, things like special cereals or this or that, uh, people are willing to pay extra. So there are premium prices in all sorts of things, in materials, in special materials and so on. So that we have to understand this whole thing about the long tail, Chris Anderson long tail, uh, which is that maybe now the opportunities are for successful, well-paying, high productivity, small companies also. So it's not the old small companies that are low productivity, but new small companies with high productivity and connected to world markets and all sorts of things. So that has become possible now. Cheap telecoms can allow access to markets from anywhere, including the rural areas of any country. That, by the way, is one of the things that's most important. We've got to guarantee that internet reaches every single corner of the territory. Otherwise, we are keeping those people out. You know, if we had the informal economy, the people who are outside, now whoever doesn't have a mobile phone is out of this world. So that is one of the most important things. But basically, the thing is that even if you are in a rural area and you produce something from there, you can export it to Germany. And you can make all, if there is a network and all the rest, because you have this possibility of working through telecoms. Then we have distribution companies that enable transport of, of small quantities. You cannot imagine, you know, I actually created a department of technological development in the Ministry of Industry in Venezuela, which is where I come from. And very often we had companies that had fantastic products and we tried to get them to be able to export to the US. And a couple of times we had it approved. And then they said, OK, we need 20 containers per month. And that was the end of the deal. Because the whole thing was not the quality of the product, but can you produce it in enough quantities that it can go through the distribution systems of the advanced world? Well, fortunately now, we have distribution systems that allow small quantities, and small can be anything from, from very small, you know, just 100 kilos or something, to really still small considered uh, international markets. So then we have something else, which is specialized retail outlets that can carry unique products, organic, environmentally friendly, homemade, handmade, etc. But even, obviously, there is also the high-tech thing, which they don't need our help. That's going very well. Uh, even the big supermarkets can carry niche products. You know, when you now see cereals that are gluten-free or no nuts or this or that, very often they're made by small companies that are doing very well. And people, of course, will pay extra because of the special health thing. We now have information about markets and technology, that it's accessible for learning and for decision making. <laughs> so that, again, is another thing. It used to be that information was completely unaccessible. Well, now we have much more information than, than we imagine, and certainly enough for many, many things that have to do with marketing. And then there are organizations such as Fair Trade that can provide support going from charities to win-win businesses, uh, win-win business networks like Starbucks. Starbucks works with several, many, cocoa, uh, coffee producers for two reasons, because they need to guarantee uh, access to quantity, whatever happens to the coffee market, and they need high quality because that's what guarantees that they can charge four and five times more in their Starbucks, wonderful places that everybody's willing to go to and pay the price for. So uh, they are working with the farmers and creating uh, co better conditions for the farmers, better, co better coffee, and, and they actually fund many of the things that increase their, 
conditions. So it's a very different context from the mass production world in which we created assembly jobs through import substitution. So it was correct at that time to do import substitution in that form, assembly basically. And, in, and of course in the processing of food, we actually had a different condition because with the assembly thing, we did the end. Even with pills and things in medicines, we got the material and then we, we punched the pills so we put it into bottles or whatever. But there was really no innovation associated with it. Whereas in food processing and in chemicals and things like that, very often you had to use the local. So if you had the local tomatoes that were like that, you could make ketchup, yes, but you had to do some, some innovation in order to make sure that your tomatoes were not round, but they were long. So even, and then the taste, and then the this, and then the that. So basically, some of our processing industries in, in Latin America are much more advanced than some of the fabricating ones, the ones that do assembly. And that's because of the nature of that, that couldn't be really just transplanted like you transplant an assembly plant and you just do it. So, the new context makes it possible to innovate in production and to rethink development policies. This is my main message, I hope. We have to rethink development policies, not just informal, not just what, we, what to do with the big, the, 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 all that together, big thinking of some direction in which we can take our economies. And of course, to know that innovation is crucial, that if you don't innovate, you don't grow. That's the other reason why Daniel is talking about our problem with companies that don't grow. They don't innovate, and they don't innovate because they don't have the skills, because they don't have the support, because they don't have the connection with the universities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So could we promote wealth creation directly in the countryside to substantially improve quality of life and reduce migration to the cities. I mean, that would be one way of at least not increasing the informal problem by having more and more slums, by more and more people migrating for the countryside. If we could turn the countryside into a wealth-producing area where those good people who would have emigrated to the cities are the leaders of those companies or those uh, wealth-creating units that we could have in the countryside. And could we promote networks and clusters to improve the condition of informal urban, urban activities? The whole thing about informality is the isolation. If they, if they could work in networks, the ones that do somewhat the same thing, we could provide skills, teach them to do business properly, to professionalize. There is an, uh, uh, a group a sort of private NGO type thing group in Venezuela that in that horrendous environment, which is anathema to anything that's practically serious, they have managed to get 8,400 people to work in clubs of entrepreneurs and getting together, in, uh, professionalizing their work. 24 cities have already this thing, just doing the work of uh, working with the informal sector to turn them into proper companies, but not little companies, but actually trying to get them into systems. That, that, by the way, is one of the most important things, to have connection between the companies and connections with the, with the knowledge sector that can support them. So what I have been arguing for the past few years is that conditions are favorable in Latin America for designing a strategy of innovation around our natural resources, both high-tech and low-tech. High-tech to be competitive with special materials and biotech and all sorts of things that are related to the fact that we have natural resources and that our labor is not, cannot compete with Chinese labor. Maybe Chinese labor is getting more expensive, but around China there's plenty of low-cost labor that they're going to continue using. And therefore the fabricating industries are very difficult to compete with unless you have a very special product. You know, if you can do Embraer, you're fine. But if you're doing just a regular thing, trying to compete making refrigerators, you're nuts. You're, you're not going to be able to do it and you're not going to be able to compete making Apple iPhones. So <laughs> the thing is that we can because there's going to be plenty of demand and prices I trust are going to go up again because of the same reason. If the world grows, they will go up because there is scarcity, so there is no way, you know, within five years, within ten years, I don't know how many, but there is going to be scarcity because 
if the world grows, there, aren't, there just aren't enough materials and, and energy of that sort to sun, there's plenty. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, the, how I see the whole thing, the big model, the big policy. I see it as a dual integrated model, top down and grassroots up, with converging processes of wealth creation and innovation associated with this combination of na natural resources and, uh, and technology. So you'd get the companies that would be engines of growth, constantly upgraded production networks around natural resources. I'm sorry I cannot explain this any further. It'll, it'll sound a bit cryptic. You can, you can go to my website, <laughs> carlottaperez.org, and there's plenty talking, writing, whatever, of this whole model of what to do in Latin America. Anyway, the whole idea is that these people would be producing competitive technologies for global markets, but then we would have an interconnected, specialized local economies in clusters all across the territory with a differentiated development of each part of the territory based on the local productive vocation identified or promoted because in some cases there's nothing really clear there, but there are resources, there are uh, skills or whatever for domestic or for foreign markets. It depends, you know, in each case. So what's the aim of the top? It's growth and generation of foreign exchange. The aim of the interconnected things at the bottom is to raise the quality of life of all inhabitants. And in between, of course, an active state facilitating and promoting local initiative, infrastructure funds, enabling institutions, human capital, and all the rest. And there are some connections between them because some of the small companies would be actually serving the engines of growth. So uh, such a dual development strategy would need two distinct sets of policies by an active state. The top-down policy framework behaving as a complement to business. Gives policy and political support. It's the so-called embedded autonomy like the Japanese and so on in achieving synergies, in, red, in negotiating with foreign partners. You know, from now on, there's going to be a lot of competition between the Far East companies and the Western companies for access to resources. So that's a wonderful opportunity to get something out of them, which is that we process rather than just, you know, that we really go down, not only just processing old style, but processing and innovating into special products, niche products, and so on, high-tech things. So uh, in doing R&D, of course, and in other needs as defined by the knowledgeable company. So you really work in a, in a very particular sort of consensus, collaborative way with business. The grassroots up policy framework would behave as local development support. So we need the local governments to be active in this. So it promotes and helps identify opportunities and market niches. It gives technical and financial support in setting up the business <laughs> and in the required innovations, provides training and offers other needed help to infant companies, and takes to facilitate systemic and network initiatives. Because basically, one of the most important things is that we need to do systemic things so that there is um, the advantages of networks. So this would require separate institutions and different personnel. Sometimes we have a ministry of industry that deals both with the big and with the small. We have, a we have a science and technology thing that deals with both the big and the small. That doesn't work. I know it well. I've worked for a long time in the, in the public sector, and I was frustrated all the time by the fact that you couldn't really adapt to both conditions. So I'm going to give you some examples from my experience. I'm sorry I'm going to be very parochial. I'm going to give you only Venezuelan examples, and basically from before Chavez. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, many have disappeared. Uh, but anyway, I I'll tell you because, because they give good examples of what I mean. So uh, one was a case of upgrading an existing product for export, the case of Telita cheese in Upata, which is a relatively medium town near the Orinoco. This is delicious cheese. Now, the thing is that by the way, this case, this thing, was done by somebody who works in CAF. He's his boss, Rafael Fuentes. He, he organized this from Conicit. So 
the starting point was that there was a low productivity and poor hygiene in a set of isolated family firms in actually subsistence, subsistence economy. They were all over. I mean, telita cheese is upata cheese. So, you know, lots of people were making that cheese. Everybody wanted the cheese. So each one more or less did it in its own little neighborhood in the area. So it was only the local market and the use by date. They didn't have a use by date, of course, but it got bad in three days. So they could only sell it in the neighborhood. So CONICIT with the support program, the agendas program, prepares the whole thing, creates a single brand, the Talita cheese thing, they created a single brand for everybody, got them all together, that did organized, you know, helped them in organization, high norms of hygiene, and you got to seven days. As soon as it lasted seven days, you could bring it to the national markets, to, to nearby cities. So they created a profitable business, which was a joint company, everybody together, all these companies together. That was not enough. So they brought IVIC, which is the Science uh, Institute. They identified the bacteria, uh, helped in changes in sterilization and packaging processes, and therefore they got to three weeks. And with three weeks, they could sell to the Caribbean. So they were competitive for export, and they were a successful enterprise. A huge change in very little time. This happened within about 14, 16 months. So it was really transforming something that wasn't a business, and it was actual informality, into a formal, well-organized, competitive industry. And there are many things that can probably be done that way. So you identify local opportunities, markets, and requirements, and you provide the technical support for taking full advantage of them. Now, how much of this is the state doing? How much of this is actual policy being done? Or is it just, you know, okay, you know, we have to rethink. Do we just take the informal economy as it is, and then we try to fix it? in itself, or do we transform the informal economy into not just formalize each person, we, we formalize pr uh, productivity and competitiveness and really serious business. Another example is a nature tourism vil village in the Andes, which can function alone or in a network. Each village becomes an inn and maintains the cultural traits as the main attra attraction for tourists. So you have some houses that have the rooms for the guests, others are the restaurant, others are for washing, others artisans and shops, uh, breeding poultry and cattle for the, for the restaurant, uh, school and tourist training for some of the other villages, uh, farming for the restaurant, uh, guides and transport, and so on. So you have every house is fixed, be becomes a nice house, because it's going to have a job, so the whole village becomes like a hotel, but everybody then, uh, the quality of their life is raised, the quality of their home, the, the hygiene of their home, and it's done directly as in contrast with jobs in a hotel, which is what we would normally think. So the network would handle international marketing, services, and management for all. So you get, the, you get a network so that you get Everybody together in one place, plus all the different... Um, I understand this, by the way, was a failed example because the money was taken for something else. But I understand, but I have to find out, maybe some of you know, that there is already a network in the Andes in other countries, not in Venezuela. And then another example, which is a private example, but a very interesting one. It's called Ato Piñero. It's a, it's a ranch. A cattle ranch, private development in the Venezuelan tropical grasslands. As you know, there you have six months of total flooding, everything flooded, and six months of total drought, fires, absolutely dry. So it's a very difficult land to work on. So these people had cattle and they had a meat business, so they decided to do breeding cattle by choosing, they brought I don't know how many exemplars until they found the best ones for that climate. And they also tried 400 types of grass to see which one would grow. So they chose the ones and they ended up selling to all the other cattle ranchers around the uh, grass, the seed. This is all innovation. They were doing actual innovation for the type of cattle and the type of grass. 
Then they had an environmental protection thing, which had a biological research center, because the whole place was declared by the owners a nature reserve. To that then, they had surplus breeding of baby alligators for leather, which they were allowed to sell after, you know, when they had more than, etc. They had a system for water and fire management, which they could sell to the others, which, which had to do with um, burning so before it would burn on its own and organizing it so they got the best possible grass. And then they set up a wonderful ecotourism hotel, ecotourism services with bird watching, taking people around and so on. The, they brought scientists from all over the world to do research in the environmental protection thing in the, in the research center. And they had to use the local population. And then the development of the local community was the last thing that they decided to do because they had uh, cattle robs, uh, robbing, you know, people were robbing the cattle, uh, entering with horses and taking some cattle away very frequently, and they had to call the police, and then they were trying themselves and so on, and they decided, no, we're going to create a, a, a belt of wealth around us, and they started helping the farmers around them to create a belt of, well -be a belt of well-being around the, the ranch, which is huge. Anyway, it was nationalized. Uh, the cattle business doesn't exist anymore. The grass seed business doesn't exist anymore. The breeding, nothing exists anymore except the ecotourism thing, which is in the hands of some people that are handling it perhaps okay, I don't know. But I mean, this is one of the tragedies. And this is not just because of the Chavez government. Things like this, I have come to the conclusion that one of the definition of the most serious definition of underdevelopment that I can come to is the incapacity for institutional accumulation. Everybody arrives and wants, instead of looking at what the other one was doing in order to do a little better, they come with a dream they had when they were named and then they just go zoom, destroy everything that was there and start from scratch again. So we never get anywhere. It's this up, up escalator that goes down. Anyway, oh sorry. <laughs> I meant to say that a local system of innovation can provide occupation, education, incomes, and innovation in relation to the environmental context. This was done in this particular case by private sector, but obviously it can be promoted by the public sector. It doesn't matter who promotes something like this, and especially if it has so much uh, innovation involved. So the opportunities are many for the local, national, and export markets. I hate to give you a list because it's going to sound puny, but anyway, a little list. Medicinal herbs, gourmet fruits and vegetables, vacation farms, organic chocolate. By the way, there is a farm in Venezuela which, is, which has five little machines designed by an engineer, a machine designer. Those five little machines can take in a relatively small farm from cocoa all the way to chocolate and change radically the economy of that, of that farm because selling cocoa, of course, is very, you know, at very low prices. But designing the five machines at that size is something that we can do, but it, it doesn't exist in the world because machines are very big for that. Nobody, and yet they were, of course, they were doing special chocolate. Then mobile phone service, that's for locals while, while you get better phone service. Special marmalade or other local specialities that can be exported if they're good enough. Construction systems with local materials. There are many architects that could go and, and then you could both have a business with the materials and the, and the construction systems and the improvement of the living of the rest of the population and so on. So bringing them or others that you can think of that you'll do better than me, uh, bringing them to fruition will require knowledge and organized support. But aiming at a major transformation across the whole territory would require an effort as massive as for the import substitution policies. I don't know if you know that for import substitution, there was the training of thousands and thousands of Latin American public servants in order to handle a very complex system that import substitution required with all sorts of things and calculations and things like that. And it was done, I think, in Intel next to Cepal. Yeah. Was it in Intel? So anyway, that, you know, the training, the thinking, the, you know, you have to sort of have a design and, and it can be done. So 
I, my idea is, should we train thousands of young graduates for two years of service in promoting wealth creation across the territory? Imagine those people would be trained for, say, four, four months, maybe. They would work for a year and a half or two years helping create these things. They would be connected among themselves. They would come out as fantastic entrepreneurs because they have created two or three things in the country, perhaps. Uh, should we set up a network of consultants from big companies willing to contribute over internet? I'm sure even the big European and American companies would be willing to give time to help uh, do these things, to see if that's a good product, if there is market for it, what would you need to do, you know, all the things that have to be added. Uh, organizing a public-private funding effort to support the initiatives promoting export networks to handle the products, because of course the main problem is once you produce whatever it is that you're going to produce, then you have to get it abroad, you have to get it somewhere, and it's, you probably need some form of network, and um, it could be promoted publicly or privately. And then training local governments to be development agents. You know, we used to have this idea that governments would have national strategies. I think we can have national directions and do a lot of things with many policies, but I think now the actual strategies in the, in the more concrete sense should be with local governments, local governments to help them actually transform their, the space over which they rule into a wealth creating space so that people will remain and have a good life. It is no bigger nor more difficult than what CEPAL did in the past for import substitution and it could make a huge difference. And let me tell you, we are precisely at a time when the whole world has to redefine which way it's going. And I think Latin America has opportunities which it will only take if it thinks big, if it thinks bold, and if it takes big decisions to transform the whole thing. Not so little problems, big thinking with a lot of policies that are systemic, and that go in a complex direction. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And now, uh, Fabiana Machado, research economist from the IDB. All right, first of all, thank you all for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm the last one to speak, we has, which has good and bad things about it. Uh, let's start with the good ones. Uh, I guess I have, do I have more than five minutes? <laughs> well, that's good for me, I guess, right? Uh, well, the bad thing is that I probably have nothing really new to say after all the presentations we went through. Um, and uh, so one of the good things that might come out of this presentation is that I am new to the uh, literature in informality. Uh, and as Cecilia put it very clearly, I was extremely confused when I read the papers. I mean, there was no way of making sense of all the different studies that are out there, the numbers, the conclusions, and all that. And this presentation is kind of my humble attempt to kind of summarize um, this literature and where things are in, in, in a way to try to think about what are the challenges ahead, things that we need to, to move past in order to advance knowledge uh, in a more structured way. Right. So hopefully it will be a good summary for uh, the day, uh, all the presentations of the day. Uh, so, uh, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go more through the micro foundations of things because I think that if we need to think about policy and what are the policies that will work, we need to understand how people anticipate the policies that we implement and for that we need to get a good understanding of mechanism, not just like the macro numbers and, and, and conjecture, but also to understand how people make decisions uh, when it comes to informality. So the, I would like to start by saying that uh, I see three main types of policy to fight informality from all the readings. Uh, there are policies that aim at enforcing formality. So you try to impose fines and, and, and other kinds of uh, monitoring to make uh, informal firms for, uh, formal. 
Others go more towards creating incentives to formality, so you're not going to impose it, but you try to create a, a, a set of rules or an environment where uh, there will be an incentive for people who are not formal to formalize. And then finally, there are some policies that aim at the creation of new formal firms. So it's not changing what the, the, ones, the existing ones are doing, but to create new ones. And I guess that uh, I, I don't need to say that all of these policies were met with varying degrees of success. We went through a couple of, uh, of them during the day today. And I think that out of the many reasons that these policies met with the varying degrees of success, um, uh, I would like to discuss three in particular because I think that one, they, they provide a good summary of what are the main challenges we face moving ahead now in terms of thinking about informality. One is that, as we notice, informality is a multidimensional problem, right? And the extra complication is that policies that solve the problem in one dimension may make the problem worse in another dimension, right? So uh, within the same problem. The second point I would like to make is that we are still learning about the determinants, right? There's still a lot of, there's no consensus whatsoever, uh, and in part it's due to this multidimensional problem. I mean, there are things that we took for granted would make uh, the problem, uh, would solve some of the problem, and we learned that they didn't do much, and that there are other determinants we haven't thought about that are coming up as studies move, move forward. And the other thing is that, uh, I think I should refer to the presentation before, is that some of the issues and dynamics underlying the problem are changing over time, right? So uh, I think uh, Carlotta will put that a lot better than, than, than I could, uh, and we just went through this in a... In a so a, as a game theorist, I try to uh, organize the thoughts and the different, um, the, the, diff the different theories and mechanisms that I saw in all of these studies. So for some people, uh, the problem of informality, well, first, it's, it's, a, decision, it's a decision problem, right? Uh, so some people see it, okay, you have the government, let's say moving first, the government's going to set the institutional uh, context, right? It will determine the level of taxes, it will determine the, the levels of uh, how complicated it is to be registered, uh, the labor regulations, the corruption level, or how much the, you, uh, um, how they deliver the benefits, and et cetera. And then once you have this, and here I just have a dichotomous thing just to make it easier. So there is one where the government may choose uh, a, a high level of, of all these complications and another uh, where it, it decides on, on uh, um, an institutional setting that we're going to call uh, low here. And uh, inside of this institutional setting, then firms and individuals need to make a decision. They need to make a decision whether to go to the formal or the informal sector, right? Uh, and uh, some people and some individuals and some firms are going to be able to afford to be formal even if all this, this institutional setting is very complex, right? So uh, either they, they are going to be bigger or they're going to have more wealth to pay for, uh, for these benefits um, or because they're bigger and it's going to be uh, harder for them to hide no matter how compli complex uh, taxes or high taxes and, and other regulations are. Uh, how, and then you have others uh, that might not be able to afford at this high level. However, if we reduce these, um, these levels of complications, if we move to the lower part, through incentives you can move the people who are at B to the C, which will be formal under uh, a lower regulatory uh, environment or low corruption or whatever you, you want to consider in the, um, at the institutional level. Right? Uh, so in that, what the result of that view is that one, you have that uh, firms and individuals who are informal are going to compete on an uneven footing with firms that are formal, right? They're formal counterparts. Uh, but then if you have, now if you suppose that the government sets these lower burdens and, and higher benefits, some of those firms that could not afford the high levels before are gonna change. So those are the ones that are gonna move from B to C. Right? Uh, but there will still going to be some that will decide to remain informal. No matter, the, the institutional context is not going to be binding, right? It, it's just a, a strategic decision of them that they are not going to formalize. Uh, and then you're going to have two kinds of informals, right? One that is constrained by the institutions where incentives are going to work, and others that no matter the institutions, they're going to decide to be um, informal. And for those, you need enforcement, right? Incentives are not going to do the trick. Right? Uh, now, 
if you go, there is another school uh, of thought uh, that thinks of this as a different problem. So first, uh, you have nature kind of deciding uh, your level of endowment. So some people, and in Latin America, that's very important because we have very unequal countries, right? So some people are going to be born, and they're going to have more opportunities. They're going to be born to wealthier families. They're going to have better opportunities in education. So you have this segmented uh, population, right? Some that will have better opportunities and more skills and et cetera, and others that will have lower. And then given that, you're going to have the government deciding what is the institutional, all the institutional setting, and of course there's also the economic context in here, and then these people are going to make a decision, right? So uh, first we have that individuals that are, um, that are endowed with, uh, with better opportunities, uh, they're going to decide to go, uh, they're going to have more chances of becoming formal, right? Uh, whereas those that are uh, less endowed are going to be more likely to become informal. So that's the view that informality is kind of a byproduct of poverty. So in a big sense, uh, that, that's the main issue about informality. And in this case, uh, you will probably favor policies, for example, that protect workers because you think of these as two segmented markets, right? You have some people operating, some people who are highly endowed operating in this market, this wealthy formal market, and then you have these people who cannot find a place in the formal market. They're going to be uh, catering also to clients and a market that is uh, informal. So there's no, let's say, uneven competition. They're just distinct, and the main problem here is poverty. So you might be able to, you might, uh, if, if you embrace this view, you might uh, support policies that protect the services or not contributory pensions or, or these other things. Where in, this, in the previous view, you wouldn't do that because you see that as an incentive towards uh, informality, right? But as we know, and I guess it's clear after all the talks we had today, most likely the two were true at the same time, right? So you have people with different endowments, you get the government making these different decisions, and then you have all these possible case scenarios here, right? And uh, but the thing here in terms of our challenges uh, is that um, in order to understand then, what do you use? Do you use incentives? Do you use, um, do you use enforcement? Do you protect those workers? Do you don't protect those workers? Because otherwise you're going to in, in, uh, create incentives for informality. Is that we need a way to measure informality or to look at these different cases uh, not necessarily one by one, but at least we need to be able to identify what kinds of workers are in these different positions so that we can try to understand what are these mechanisms and what kinds of policies are going to apply in these, uh, in these very different cases, right? So the issue of measurement, as we saw today, is like critical uh, for us. And uh, there is, as we saw, there is multiple definitions of, um, of uh, informality floating around. And uh, in reading papers, you see that even people who are using the exact same definition uh, come up with different numbers, right? So even if we all agree on a certain thing, and that might be because of the, the way the question is asked in household surveys or public opinion surveys or whatever, but this is something that I guess uh, it is, it, we should, as researchers in that area, put some effort into uh, thinking uh, about this, this um, a consensus in how to do that. So just to give you an example for you here, this is, I use a public opinion survey usually, so I'm going to base my example because that's the kind of data that I have. This is the LAPOP survey, which is nationally representative, that was collected in 2010. And why 2010? That was the only year where they actually asked three questions that are usually used to identify uh, informals, which is whether they are self-employed, whether they contributed pensions, and whether they, they, they possess health insurance. And here, what I'm just plotting to you is that for each one of the countries, if you take each one of these definitions, one, we have a lot of differences in, the, in, in levels, like you would predict very different levels of informality. And the other that's more worrying, if you look at the, the countries of the Caribbean, is that you would rank them differently depending on what measure you use, right? So. Um, this makes it, uh, it, it uh, very, uh, very complicated to, uh, to study the micro, the mechanism, right? Because you might get different, uh, um, you might uh, get different results if you choose these different, um, these different measures. 
But that's not uh, the only problem. The other problem is that these differences that you see here are not necessarily the, the, the actual differences you'd be looking at, because if you look at the overlap of these different measures, there's not much. Right? So the people that will be categorized as informals, no matter what measure you pick, is like in the order of 37% uh, in, in this data. Right? So you're going to be analyzing very different people who are probably facing very different uh, decision, uh, decisions and who have very different opportunities. Right? So how, uh, what, what is the consequence of that lack of, of overlap? So in terms of individual characteristics, um, here we just compile like a few of the characteristics belonging to each one of these groups. And whereas in terms of occupation, you have perfect overlap actually in terms of uh, the, the three different um, categorizations, one that includes all of them and one that is one by one. And the last one is uh, what would be considered as formal employment, right? However, in terms of the gender composition, there's huge differences, right? It goes from 48% to 70% male, depending on what group you're looking at, right? In terms of urban or rural, you also have some big uh, differences, right? And in terms of year of education, you also see some significant differences, right? So all of these we need to take into account when, and, and very rarely I found uh, studies really show you this descriptive statistics so that you know what exactly is that, that we are talking about or referring to um, when, uh, when we're studying this. And here, just to uh, take on a little bit of what David was doing before, I look at how, what is the bivariate relationship? This is very simple. It's just a bivariate relationship between these, the issue here is trust. So it's an interpersonal trust question. And each one of the definitions, right? The first graph is uh, pension, uh, the ones defined by pension, the second self-employed, and the other health insurance. So one, what we see is uh, there is some overlap between, uh, between the, 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 the different measures, but you have uh, more significant uh, differences uh, when, with respect to uh, the ones defined as pensions. And in general, the informal people are more distrustful, right? That's the negative uh, correlation here, right? But the other thing you see is that there's huge variation across countries, right? Uh, so uh, maybe it has to do with the fact that these people are making decisions within a particular context. So the person making a decision within the context of Argentina is very different from the one in Brazil, depending on what are the policies uh, they have in place. So that might matter too in order to uh, analyze these issues, right? In terms of, this is uh, their position in regards to a question on whether the government should implement policies to reduce inequality, right? Usually there is a lot of agreement with that kind of question in Latin America. And here, uh, results uh, vary more per country, right? Uh, except that if you look at the different categories, uh, um, except that uh, Guatemala, which is, where is it? Yeah, Guatemala in the middle, where you have, for the, pens, for the ones defined in pension, the, the association is positive and significant. For the ones uh, determined in terms of health is negative and significant. Um, so uh, j just to uh, illustrate a little bit this, this problem of, of, of measurement. And here is self-reported uh, participation in voting in the previous elections in, in their country. And uh, here we see that those that are the defined based on uh, being self-employed, um, there are less significant differences. And uh, informals are less likely actually to report voting, right? That's uh, what all the, the, the negative coefficients here uh, imply. So they seem, in general, there are some consistency, but there's still enough differences to warrant uh, paying attention to how, how we determine these things. In general, they seem to be less, uh, they, they, they seem to participate less politically and uh, have lower levels of trust and, and et cetera, right? So there, there are some, some, interesting, uh, some interesting aspects in there. 
So how the, the other question is um, how to measure, right? It's a still common practice to measure informality in a dichotomous way. And as we saw, again, in many of the presentations, we'll have a very mixed group of people that are, will be counting as informals, right? So you have people who have a choice and people who don't have a choice. They are informals because they couldn't find a job in the formal sector because they need to survive, right? And they are going to probably build uh, firms not with a long-term view. They're going to build a firm, it's small, they don't want to innovate, they don't want to uh, necessarily uh, grow because they, it's, for them it's just a temporary solution to the problem of finding a job, right? Uh, you have workers that don't have a decision, you have business owners who can probably make the decision, right? You have business owners of last resort versus business, business owners who can't afford to pay the taxes and, 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 uh, uh, and join the, the formal sector. You are also going to have a mix of people who are legal, right? Because self-employed without protection is not illegal. They have a choice. So in, under certain definitions like pensions and stuff, we're going to be considered certain people who are legal to be informals. And you also have the illegals. So workers that are working for, uh, they are not being registered by, by their fir or firms that are not paying their taxes and, and et cetera, right? So, and I think that in order to uh, get to this point to really reach a consensus about how we're going to measure these different, uh, these different things. We also need to delve a little bit more into the mechanisms in, in, in terms of what is it really that uh, these different people are, are deciding upon and what is the size of these different groups. Maybe in some cases there is a group that is a majority so it makes sense to look at things uh, uh, in, in more in the aggregate or in a dichotomous way, but most likely we have this very, very particular groups that we need to find a way to operationalize and, and be able to collect data on it, right? Uh, design our own uh, design questions or, or something along these lines. And the other point I wanted to make about measurement is that, so we're, we're wondering, sometimes we measure informality by the outcomes of informality. Right? So we're going to take all the small firms and say that they're informal. But if you want to understand what makes an, a small firm want to grow bigger, we need variation. Right? We need to have informal firms and formal firms of the same size. Right? Because that is what is going to give us, in terms of data, uh, the, uh, th this variation is necessary for us to study uh, this mechanism. So, um, and the, uh, so just to move to the other point is um, we need to learn more about the, the determinants of informality uh, and in order to, to design policy we need to, uh, it, it requires us to, to make uh, progress in that, in that area. And uh, most likely, the problem here is that most likely different determinants would matter more depending on which one of these uh, groups we're talking about, where in that decision tree we are, we are whether we're talking about legal legals or, or firms and individuals and et cetera. And uh, here's just a, a quick list of some of the determinants that, that are, are common out in the literature. So we can think about the institutional environment with government policy, with government capacity, which is uh, how, from rule of law to the enforcement of tax regulations and corruption, which is the, the uh, worker is going to evaluate. If I enroll on a pension scheme, I want to make sure that the money is going to be there when I retire. If I don't trust the government to have that money available, then I probably will downplay the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the value of the benefit, right? And then there are also individual characteristics, right? We have seen more and more with impact evaluations and with uh, survey data that individual characteristics matter a lot. Not only their preferences in terms of work, like wanting flexibility, wanting independence, but of course the skill level, the occupation, the education, and their perceptions of, of, of government, such as uh, the issue of trust that we saw. And, uh, so, and I think that we've been going through a, 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 a phase where we were thinking some of these determinants. So if you look at this, the, the, the results of experimental uh, studies out there, uh, they have been showing basically that the easiness of registering a business is not really critical, right? There are many studies, uh, many impact evaluations that were done with that. Basically, they get a number of people or they don't get a lot of, they get about 30, one third of the, the, the firms registering, 
but this effect is not, doesn't last in the long term. So if you follow up, this firm's like the simplest in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, nowadays, when you talk, when you, want the, when you see it, the, the numbers, they're, they're a lot lower than they were when the, the, the project was first put in place, right? And when you combine these with more qualitative studies or survey data uh, that has been done, some studies have been done by the World Bank, you see that these institutional factors actually are downplayed by two important factors. One is the perceived burdens of maintaining a formal status. So the problem is not just registering, is that if I register and if I think that it's going to be a lot of work to be filing for taxes and being formal and, and how much work that, that, will, that will entail, people kind of stay away from, uh, from, from, from registering, not because they don't see benefits to being formal in the sense of having more access to clients and et cetera, but, but just the burdens of the whole process, not just the registration, but what, what, what comes after that is very, very important. And in particular, non-pecuniary benefits such as flexibility, right? So in one study, they found, for example, that for low-skilled uh, labor, who did not have a choice of whether they were formal or informal, it was a decision of their boss, there is a huge wage gap, and that gap is not uh, covered by these non-pecuniary benefits. But for people who do have a choice between being formal or informal, even though there was a wage gap, it was completely, uh, um, the tr it was completely um, compensated by the flexibility they had, by the, uh, you know, having their own hours and not having a boss and et cetera. So some people have, that's how they, they, they that, that's an important part of the utility function, right? And I guess also the other thing is that uh, working with public opinion survey and looking at studies, uh, sometimes uh, looking at countries in aggregate conceals a lot of, uh, a lot of important information. As we've seen in the survey data, there is usually a lot more variation across countries than across groups within a country, right? Uh, so there is a lot to be gained, I guess, from within country comparisons in particular. In, 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 there is a study by Chong in Peru that also says that institutional factors, uh, I mean, are downplayed when you consider individual characteristics of, of workers uh, in Peru, right? And finally, uh, on informality over time, I think I should just put your address in there, <laughs> Carlota Perez, because I think you, you explained that a lot better. The only thing I wanted to say here is that we have this fascination with, oh, we have to go bigger firms, bigger firms, more productivity. But nowadays, with all the technology we have, there are ways of actually organizing independent workers who Pray, who, who value being flexible and not having a boss in ways that we can, uh, one, keep better track of the, who they are. So Uber and EduWizards is an app in India where uh, tutors for different subjects in school are assigned to families and kids. Uh, and actually the tax that they own on their hourly rate, wage is, is uh, taken by the app uh, before, so as they get paid. So because all of these trans transactions happen online and with credit cards and stuff, it's a lot easier to keep track of, right? So that's one, uh, one advantage of, of these technological advances. People can still continue to be flexible and, and, and productive because these, these apps, what they're doing is pulling all this force and, and using their labor in an efficient way. They are reviewed, which encourages them to uh, acquire skills and get better at the jobs that they're doing. So there is a number of incentives uh, that are aligned. So one of the things I was wondering is, is if whether we should uh, think more about these kind of policies that are new uh, uh, to, uh, as, as a way of um, ameliorating uh, the issue of informality. So just to uh, recap uh, quickly, so the basis of sound policy rests on two critical types of information. One is a clear statement of the problem and then a decent understanding of the mechanism, right? And at the same time that informality is a, com is a, a concept that is too complex to allow us to identify these two pieces of information in a very, in a general systemic way, uh, we are not able to look at these realities or segments independent of each other, right? So we need to be able to develop policies in a way that take into account that the mechanism that we are focusing on is one, but a, in a way that there's not going to be negative externalities to other dimensions of the same problem. Let's put it that way. Right? 
Uh, and we need both theory and better measures. So there's a lot of students here, and uh, so there's a lot, a lot of scope for improvement in, in, in that way. And I think we need to move towards a, a little bit of a consensus on the criteria we use to measure these things. It has been done, for example, in the area of infrastructure, that people sat down and put together, how are we going to measure access to water in a way that people can include in their household survey, so that at least we're measuring uh, the same thing. And uh, mixed data collection, I guess more and more the, the perceptions and beliefs of people matter, not only the objective uh, institutional setting. And uh, also a higher focus on, on these different dimensions of informality and finally uh, incorporating these new, uh, these new technologies. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Fabiana. We, we had three very fascinating presentations. Daniel Ortega, who linked informality with the prevalence of smaller firms, small firms, and in a way provide us with a picture, small firms that do not grow, and it's a stagnated picture. <laughs> Carlota Perez emphasized on the new context that makes it possible to innovate in production and to rethink development policies in big ways. And then finally, Fabiana Machado, who looked at the challenges to uh, pursue governmental policies towards informality, uh, stressing on the multidimensional nature of the problem, the difficulties in measurement, and the problems of informality over time. I'm afraid I think we ran out of time. I was instructed by, oh, Diego is asking me, well, great, thank you for changing the instructions. I was, that's good, Just, uh, we have these informal rules here. So, uh, Jose Antonio. Uh, but but uh, uh, let me uh, let me restate uh, one point that I made before and ask a question. But the, you know, I restate that uh, using the same name, the same term, to refer to two different or three different things is not a good idea, particularly for policy. So this is my point uh, in relation to the use of the concept of informality. Informality. Uh, Yes, in terms of access to social protection system, health, uh, pensions, etc., is one thing is taken care of by ministers of health and ministers, uh, uh, let's say, of pensions or whatever is, is charged in pensions, in trying to see how you incorporate all workers that do not uh, uh, are not wage, uh, you know, uh, do not have a wage relation. Uh, that's one point. I mean, and, and again, this is something that is being done much better than the second issue, which is the issue that uh, of so-called economic informality, which is that uh, the, is the one in, for which you, I would I would use the concept of informality, which is the original concept of informality, uh, because the, you know mixing the same term for two different things is not a good idea. But anyway. Uh, so uh, Daniela and Carlota referred to that concept, and, uh, and when I, I was struck by how different the, the views were. You know, like Daniel was for large employment, large scale employment, and Carlota for you know networks. You know, just to to say you know a question what? Both. I never said not to do the large part. Uh, okay, you do no, but my, my point is, uh, I would uh, like to. Uh, to, uh, to see the, Daniel's reaction to Carlota's presentation. But also, Carlota, the one particular point, I think the most difficult of all in what you have said is how you guarantee viable associations. Uh, because you, for that, you need viable associations. Uh, and who organizes, what guarantees the consistency and the persistence of that association uh, you know, let's say the, in the old days you will think of cooperative systems uh, of some form. Uh, now the networks may not be cooperatives, uh, but so the, what is guaranteed? And, and you probably have, you probably need uh, associations of different levels. For example, at the local level, you know, for organizing local production, that's one association. But for example, you want to do a, a international trade. Uh, of, uh, of certain product, you need a, a higher scale association. You know, may, maybe you know. By the way, this is an issue that I, I I've seen no research about how you guarantee 
viable associations uh, in, uh, uh, of producers of different size, or particularly of small scale producers. So maybe uh, actually, the, you know, for, for CAF it will be, or for other international institutions, be good, a good thing to research, to do research on. I mean, there are probably, I mean, le let me say that the Colombian coffee sector is one of the successful stories, more or less, uh, of how you get lots of small producers organized to produce high quality product for international markets and increasingly differentiating qualities, which is a characteristic today that, you know, uh, you know that was very much uh, emphasized by Carlota. Can I take uh, uh, Jose Antonio's question and, and ask the panel to, in fact, I, I sort of also thought that there may be some clashes between Daniel's presentation and, and the other two presentations. Perhaps there is, there is not, not a clash. They, co they can complement so. each other. So if you want, you want to comment on, on what Jose Antonio has raised. I loved Carlota's presentation. <laughs> It was, and I it was, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's so, they're both right. And I think that, and I think we're both right. Yeah. Uh, that's my point. So we choose to. I chose to emphasize uh, the aspect which I believe will create the greatest employment and productivity gains in the short term, which is basically to help move our situation, our use of our factors of production closer to the technology frontier. So if you think about, you know, where are we, we, we you, you draw the, the production possibilities frontier, Latin America is way within the, the frontier. So there are important ways in which you can reallocate, increase the efficiency of, res of resource use, and get closer to that frontier. So that's, that's I think, the, the aspect of it which I am trying to emphasize. We actually have a book on promoting entrepreneurship and innovation and, when, and where we, hit, we lay out a whole discussion on the importance of promoting and despite the fact that you want to do these big things and help large firms grow and, and all of these other things, you also want to have a proper environment and promote an environment in which small firms that have the potential to grow into highly productive firms actually thrive. And where associative uh, mechanisms that, might, that could be promoted from the private sector or the public sector are actually also promoted. So we actually, I just didn't emphasize that in my presentation, uh, but you know, we completely agree with, uh, <laughs> with, with Carlota. So I think mm -hmm. our presentations are actually complementary. Uh, and they shouldn't be viewed at all as, as substitutes. You want to reinforce that view? I absolutely. No. But, but I want to answer this viable associations thing because I think it is extremely important. And uh, I had proposed this whole idea that we could transform the countryside in order to reduce migration and to improve quality of life and all that. I actually proposed it in a meeting in CAF, and uh, I had been talking to Alicia Cárdenas, and maybe we could do it with Sepal, and I was actually thinking of dedicating the rest of my life to getting that done. And then I talked to somebody who has been working, the one I mentioned there, who has, you know, who has now 8,400 people working in networks of uh, entrepreneurs in Venezuela and so on, this was, and then he said, you know, you need leaders. Those things, you know, you can have because the idea is to bring young, educated people just graduated to come and work and find the possibilities and set them up and learn about how to get the bank to lend the money and how to set up the company and how to do, you know, the whole thing. These people would know and they would be teaching and they would have also coaching skills and things like that to get, I mean, it was sort of like a complete dream. And he said, you know, the problem is that the guys or gals who could do the actual organization of this, they are the ones who migrate. So you get in the countryside the people who stay, and they are the ones who are not going to be, you know, capable of holding an organization that will work. So I, I started thinking about it, and it's very frightening. How do you do it? How do you start something which is already... There is already a problem, and how do you get 
uh, the type of skills you would need to, to train almost the people to be able to have viable organizations. Because I think what you said about the coffee is very important. If you actually have the trading people, the ones that are going to take care of the export or whatever, they can help. And in fact, many companies, many even global companies who do uh, trade with uh, products from clusters in the, in the developing countries, they do. They do training. They do training about the product. They do training about you know, quality, how to organize it. They do a lot. And they're quite successful. There are several clusters that have been studied. And they work. So it's a problem. I think it has to be faced. But I think the whole question of whether the countryside can be saved as long as the cities continue extracting the best people, I don't know. It becomes a, a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Fabiana, so, you want to comment briefly? Just quickly, yeah. No, the, the, all I wanted to say was that it looks like they're, the policies that they're proposing are kind of targeted. So in terms of the negative spillovers that one would have for the other, uh, I guess the real question is uh, one of budget constraint, whether if you have to decide between, do, what do you do first? Do you do what you propose or what you do what uh, Daniel proposed? Then we would need to get into what the I issues. But you, <laughs> yeah. Two separate things, two yeah. separate policies, two separate types of people. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. two separate things. Yes. yes. And, and we have to understand that. I think the, yeah. the last question here, Levin. <laughs> Thank you for the floor. I would actually like to draw attention on the last bullet point on this slide, which is new technologies and informality, uh -huh. and like the impact that new technologies can have, or the potential actually, because I think this is something that we kind of overlook today. Mm -hmm. um, so actually yesterday I was at a very similar conference um, with like the same theme, but the focus was on Europe instead of Latin America. And the consensus seemed to be that like they asked if the welfare state in Europe is designed for the 21st century economic, e economies. And the consensus was kind of it's not because we see this shift, especially in the service sector, towards uh, like Uber and this kind of uh, sharing economy, all these um, phenomena. So I feel like um, while the European lawmakers are struggling with how to, uh, how to accommodate this, maybe we, from the Latin American perspective, should actually see this as a potential, as you said in the end, rightly so. Um, of yeah, kind of organizing uh, informal labor and trying to, to, to get them together and then start from there in, mm -hmm. in terms of tackling informality. Thank you. May I ask the panelists to briefly offer a minute reflection to wrap up the whole thing. We start with Fabiana and then followed by Carlota and, 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 and Daniel. No, just to wrap up, yeah, I, I think that this is a, a very exciting uh, area of research, and I think there's a lot of things that we're coming to, to know, and, and I totally agree that we should look more into these new technologies, as, as, as I pointed out, uh, to try to solve the problem. But in order to make real progress, I think we need to discuss or be, either be more specific about what, what is it that we're talking about. Either instead of labeling it as informality, we can label it as all oh, workers that are not protected or, uh, I don't know, war, uh, uh, firms that are not paying their taxes, but always taking into account that they're part of this global problem, which is informality, so that when we design policies, we know how they're going to affect the different, the different shares. Carlotto? Uh, I think we need to rethink the role of the state in this whole thing, and not think of informality, but think of wealth creation across the country, Think of knowledge and information and capabilities being spread. And that means at all, you know, to get companies that are able to grow because you create conditions for that. But to think in terms of a big strategy, if we continue doing a little thing, what are we going to do about informality? What are we going to do about this? It's not going to work. We, we are in a completely different world. What he's saying now about, about Uberization of all sorts of things, that's going to happen in the north and it's going to come to us too. So we've got to know how to handle that. And you know, really look at technical change. Look at the type of active state that could give a direction. And we have to work with society, take decisions together. You know, we're, we're, we're doing little patches. I feel we're doing little patches. I don't see any country really having a strategy you know, where you feel. And I think this whole thing about free markets created a, a paralysis that people don't really dare think together and think ahead and 
have a vision. We have to have a vision. Without a vision, we're not going anywhere. We're just going to do little patches. Final thought? Um, I think that the world is a different place. Uh, someone mentioned this earlier today, and I think Carlota's presentation underscores this. The possibilities for production, organizing production today are very different from what they were many years ago, even a few years ago, uh, with Uberization and all of this. So this opens up a world of possibilities in terms of changing the way we organize our resources to produce well-being. Uh, absolutely. Now, I also wa want to uh, s underscore one important conclusion that I think has come not only from Fabiana's point, but also from your point, from uh, Jose Antonio's point, um, and, uh, and from Carlota, is that the definite, what we call informality is really unimportant. What we really need to use are specific concepts, economic concepts, and think about what they imply. If we want to measure firms that don't pay, pay taxes, what does that imply in terms of incentives, in terms of the theory, the economic theory and political theory behind that behavior? I think that's what's really important. Not if we call, infor not if we use informality for this or this other concept, at least not when we're trying to think about policy. I mean, if we're trying to make a, a, a political broad brush argument, then maybe that's okay. But I really don't think that the specific use of the term in one way or another is particularly important. I think we just need to be clear about what we're using it for, what we mean by it, and then what the specific implication of the analysis that derives from that are. Um, and finally, uh, I, I, I do agree completely that despite the fact that a new world has opened up in terms of production possibilities, I also think that at a very basic level, a good part of our workforce is dedicated to things it should not be dedicated to. And that is part of the, the argument that we are trying to make. Most of the people who form the, what we usually call the informal sector, people who work, who are either self-employed, uh, not, un, uh, uh, non-professional, uh, unemployed, uh, uh, self-employed, and people who work in, in small firms, they should be working for someone else. They shouldn't be entrepreneurs even though there are many possibilities for entrepreneurship. So this is a key distinction that we need to make. Wh which part of the labor force really has the potential to thrive and to become leaders in this new world of production? And which part of the population should basically, at this point, be working for someone else? And by working for someone else, be much more productive, because that's part of the thing that the literature, literature actually shows. If you work for someone else, you would have a much higher salary, much more stable income, and much better prospects for your children. Well, I wish we had more time to continue this fascinating discussion, but I have to bring this to a close. And just please join me to thank you again, the panelists. Thank you.